Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. You as the people of God who are here. We get to come to worship him who has loved us, who has called us to be part of his family. Those of you who are worshiping online, again, welcome. We are glad that you are with us. Whether we are at home or here in worship, it is good for us to be together. Because Jesus said, wherever two or three or 20 or 40 or 50 or 103 or 503 are gathered, he is present. So we come to worship him and bless his holy name. Would you please stand with me if you're able to and let's open with the opening hymn. begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 133 says these words, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let's continue to worship.
given to you for your voices. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I'd like to ask you to keep these families in your prayers. Debbie Jackson, whose husband Bruce Jackson was called home by our Lord much too soon for all of us. And uh, he will be accorded Christian burial here at St. Timothy this coming Thursday. It was initially planned for Friday at 2 p.m. You'll notice if you saw the mailing that it is Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. There will be a 1 p.m. visitation between 1 and 2 with Debbie and the family. If you want to be here, we'll be here in the sanctuary. There will, however, be overflow in the Life Center. And uh, it will also be broadcast on uh, live streamed on our YouTube channel. And I think, I don't know if it's our website. If Pat's going, that's enough. Don't mess it up, Steve. Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah. That on our website. I'm not as technologically savvy as almost all the rest of them. Would I ask if you would pray for Sue Strother? I remember Justin Strother's mom. She has been battling with COVID for some weeks now. And there have been complications. We're just praying for God to pour healing life and grace for her, for Johnny Blake as he continues to still be hospitalized. He has now been transferred to Nexus Hospital and also for Morbic Sumner. He is getting actually better a little bit by little bit. So they've removed, not as removed as oxygen, but lowered the oxygen rate. And we're thankful for that. We also want to continue to pray with the Bratz family, their friend, little CJ, who is seven years old, who is battling with cancer. We want to pray healing for him and for the rest of those that we love who are undergoing cancer. Praises to God for Chris Leslie, Richard and Rebecca's son, who did have successful surgery. So for all the prayers that are answered and those that we still bring, let's go to our God in prayer. The words of the hymn, Lord, say, Oh, that I had a thousand voices so that I might praise you each and every day with thousand tongues. Then we would proclaim in grateful songs and we would give you praise for all that you have done. For all the creatures of you have created this world that you sustain. You give us faith to hold on here and to live until that day that you call us home to really celebrate all that you have redeemed us to receive and to experience in heaven. Lord, it is with that assurance that we lay Bruce to rest. We are stunned and shocked and saddened by his loss. And yet, Lord, you do the day you bring him home. And so I can find joy in that. I can rejoice in that, that he is home with you in glory, home with all those who have gone before him. And until we Get to that day when you call us, Lord. I pray for you to sustain us with faith, with hope, with courage. I pray that for Debbie. I pray that for Rachel and Kevin, for Jacqueline and Jonas. I pray that for all of that family and for this St. Timothy family, Lord, who are all so very saddened by Bruce's loss. But Lord Jesus, we know that you have won the victory for him and we celebrate not just for Bruce, but all of those that we have laid to rest. I pray comfort and strength and hope for every person here who has faced that loss of a loved one. And Lord, for those who battle with COVID, especially lift up Sue, for Johnny, for Morbic, for those who are being treated right now, many whom we love that have not been named here individually. Lord, every one of us, at least almost every one of us, has someone that we know or many people that we know that have been affected by this have been sickened by it. And we continue to pray for healing and strength for each person. I pray for those men and women who are doctors, the nurses, the technicians, those who care and care for our patients and treat them, Lord. I just pray for wisdom and strength and perseverance and endurance. It is so very difficult and tiring. And so I just pray, Lord, for extra measures of grace for them. For those of us who wait in this difficult season, Lord, you tell us to trust you for all things, and we do. And we wait for you until you, in your sovereign will, decide to remove COVID as this significant issue. Until then, Lord, we pray for hope and courage and patience and forbearance. And we pray, Lord, for you to fill us, even at this time, with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. We rejoice that you have answered the prayers for Chris Leslie that he's gone through this surgery successfully. And we pray for little CJ, pray for his entire family. We pray, Lord, for you to surround them with comfort and with grace 
faith and strength. And for not just him, for all the rest of those that we love going through cancer, we pray for your healing touch. Jesus, for all the prayers that we bring before your throne today, we lift them up in your strong and powerful name because you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Whatever it is that you may be facing right now, this song will remind us all of the, fo- of the strength and grace we find as we turn our eyes upon Jesus. Wow. Amen. Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your gift. Would you turn your attention with me now to the reading of God's holy word? Good morning. The New Testament reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
verses 10 through 17. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. Would you please stand with me for the reading of the gospel? The gospel reading comes from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. In the waters of our baptism, we have been claimed as his children by the power of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's speak of his work in our lives now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was to the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
you pray with me? Jesus, you are the tie that binds us together. It is in you that we are unified. It is in you that we have our hope. It is in you that we have everything because you are the all in all. And Jesus, I pray that this morning and these days and this time and that each and every day forward, God, that you would unite us more and more because our eyes are fixed on you. Speak to our hearts this morning, Jesus. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We are in the middle of a series entitled Bodybuilding. We're looking at how we can build up the body of Christ, how we can be strong together as God has intended. We've been talking a lot about being connected. We've been talking a lot about being unified. Well, today I want to kind of start off by talking about the opposite. We're talking about unity. What's the opposite of unity? Division. Whew. Would you say that we're experiencing some division in our world right now? Just a, just a wee bit. I, I wrote a few of these things down. You know, we are divided today by a virus. We are divided today by masks. We're divided today by a vaccine. We're divided today by politics. We're divided today by politicians. We're divided today by issues like gender or race or any of these other things. I actually feel like we are at a point where a true fight or riot could break out over which is better, Coke or Pepsi, or which fast food restaurant we should go to, McDonald's or Burger King. We've all experienced division. We've experienced division. Sometimes it happens in our home. Sometimes it happens in our schools. Sometimes it happens, unfortunately, in our churches. It happens in our nation. We see it in teams. Division is all over. But for the last nine months, or maybe a little bit more, because of a pandemic, it seems like everything is absolutely heightened. And the divisions, things that we used to maybe shrug off, become intensified. And so what do we do about them? When the divisions arise, what do we do? Well, I don't know if it's what we should do, but what's happening in our world is we argue, right? We argue. I have to get my way. We argue vehemently. We argue passionately. Or we do this. We post snarky social media posts. Right? Because those help. That's beneficial, right? And you know, I can understand it. I truly can. There's a lot of pressure out there right now. There's a lot of just... Ah, I don't even know what the word is anymore. There's just there. You feel it. But I can tell you this. What's worried me the most over the last nine months isn't the pandemic. It's not the snarky social media posts. It's not even the anger. It's what's happening inside the church with relation to these issues. Because the scariest thing that I've seen is that inside the church, I have witnessed people, and I'm not just talking about this church, I'm not just talking about the Lutheran church, I'm talking about in the church as a whole, I have seen Christians argue and attack other Christians because of these divisions. And I've seen it from people that I love. You know, I, I, I think about my own social media account. You probably go, Brad, we don't ever see you on social media. Unless the church posts something from me, <laughs> you probably don't see me on social media. But here's the thing, I'm a pastor. So the majority of the people that I am associated with on Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, are other church workers, are members of churches that I've been a part of. So the majority of my social media content comes from who? The church. And I see this of people arguing with 
and attacking other people with inside the church. And I go, this can't be. It's almost like we're living out this Peanuts cartoon that I found. You can put that up on the screen. I don't know if you can see this. Siblings, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. Lucy walks in, change the channel. I said, switch the channel. I want to watch my program. Are you kidding me? You think you can just walk right in here and take over? These five, what, what, what's, what, well, I read that wrong. What makes you think you can walk in and take over? And she says, these five fingers. Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this, into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. What channel do you want? Sigh. Looks at his hand and says, why can't you guys get organized like that? I feel like that's what we're living in our world. Switch the channel. You can insert anything. Vote this way. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. What makes you think you can make me do that? These five fingers when they are together. And that's what we're living. And I'm scared that we're taking it out on each other within the church. And as we're talking about this bodybuilding series, I have to think of what does God's word say about how we are to live and work together and be truly unified. So if we go to our New Testament reading for today, we begin to see Paul addressing some of these issues. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 10 through 17. If you want to open your Bibles or follow along on your phone, Paul writes these words. He says, I appeal, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly unified in mind and thought. I want to pause there for just one second. He says three very important things about how the body of Christ is supposed to interact with each other. He says, I appeal to you as brothers and sisters, as people who are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That all of you agree with each other in what you say. Whoa. There are no divisions among you and that you are perfectly unified or united in mind and thought. Agree in what you say. No divisions among you. Perfectly unified in mind and thought. Would you believe that this is an accurate representation of the church that we see today? It's not what I'm seeing, and it hurts. He goes on, and he addresses what the Corinthians were dealing with. He says, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. You see, what was going on in the Corinthian church is they had had a lot of people come through with a lot of great opinions. Nothing of it was wrong. Paul was the one who came and founded the church in Corinth. And so people said, well, I follow the teachings of Paul. Then Apollos came through, and Apollos was a gifted preacher of God's word. And people were taken in by that. He proclaims the word of God very well. I follow Apollos. And then Cephas, or Peter, came through. And when Peter came through, they were like, he's one of the original 12. He's an original disciple of Jesus Christ. I follow Cephas. And there's other people going, aren't we supposed to follow Jesus? And so they started arguing and bickering. They started going back and forth. And finally, 
Chloe is the one who writes to Paul. And so he says, agree in what you say, be perfectly united in mind and thought, and have no divisions. If you've read the entire book of 1 Corinthians and even 2 Corinthians, the Corinthian church was kind of a mess. It was kind of a mess. There were lots of things that were dividing them. Here it was who we follow. Later on you would find out that it was class that was dividing them. You'd also find out that it was practices in the Lord's Supper that was dividing them. They had lots of things to be divided over and Paul was writing them to remind them. It's not about the things that divide you. It's about what brings you together. It's about being united as a team. As a team. A body. You know, I've had the privilege in my life of being a part of many teams. I love playing sports growing up, whether it was soccer, basketball, baseball, whatever it might be. And now in this stage of my life, I find myself coaching teams. What happens when something goes wrong in a team sport? When something doesn't go your way, what happens? Well, it's usually one of two things. One, the team starts bickering with each other. Any of you seen that happen with the team? Something bad goes on in the game? Just one play, easily able to overcome, and people start pointing the finger. You, you did this, you did this. No, it was your fault, you should have been here. And they start bickering. And what happens when the team starts bickering with each other? Are they effective? No. Are they efficient? No. Do they win? No. And if the team is bickering with each other, there's no help of carrying out the goal of the team. Now the other thing that can happen when division or a problem arises within a team is it can gel them. It can bring them together. They can become more unified. What happens then? When you rally around each other, whether you win or lose is the moot point at this point. What happens is they begin to work together. They support them. It's okay. It's not your fault. We got this. Let's move to head. Let's get together. I've witnessed this as part of a team. I've witnessed this as a coach. What you want to see happen is for the team to play united. And Paul is writing this, and he's saying, I'm hearing these words. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. And I don't think there's some major religious issue that's dividing the church right now. I think it's all the other divisions that are seeping into the church. And now, we have Christians all over the world who are saying, I follow this political party. I follow this politician. I follow this opinion. I follow that opinion. And we've gotten to the point where if you don't follow what I think you should follow, I'm done with you. You're no longer part of my life. Is that what the church is supposed to look like? Is that what the body of Christ is supposed to be? Absolutely not. And so Paul continues He goes on. He says, our identity is supposed to be in Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he asks this question. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? You know what it sounds like to me right here? It sounds like Paul is sitting the Corinthians down in time out, and he's kind of lecturing them. You know, like we do with our kids. They act up. Your kids are bickering, they're fighting. Okay, guys, you're in timeout, and here is why you are in timeout. I want to make this clear to you. And maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's what a pandemic is. We're in timeout to remind us of what really unites us. Because as Paul says, is Christ divided? Let me ask you this question Is Jesus Christ divided? No. Not at all. 
Let's continue on with Paul's logic. This is going to hurt for some of us. Did a Democrat or a Republican die for you? No. Let me ask you this. Were you baptized into America? Did salvation come from a politician? No. Not at all. Where did it come from? A Savior. Jesus Christ. And Paul even goes as far as he starts saying, I'm just so glad I didn't even baptize so you can't say this. He's almost trying to justify, he is trying to justify his point here. We weren't baptized into any of the things that are dividing us right now. We were united by Jesus Christ. Politics didn't give me grace. America didn't give me grace. Salvation came from nowhere else but Jesus and Him crucified and risen. The fact of the matter is it's that Jesus Christ is the one who died. Jesus Christ is the one who rose. Jesus Christ is the one who gives grace back then, today, and tomorrow. Jesus Christ is the one who united us as part of his family into one body. Jesus Christ is the one who sustains us. Jesus Christ is the one who is ruling. Jesus Christ is the one who is reigning. Jesus Christ is the one who is sovereign, who is Lord of all, who none of this is unfamiliar to him. And I can't say those things about anything or anyone else in the entire universe. Our sovereign Lord has things under control. So it makes me think, if there are still divisions in the church, what's the basis of them? Is it really all this other stuff that's out there? Or is it in who we're trusting? Are we trusting for America or the politician or this opinion to fix the situation around us? Or are we trusting in Jesus Christ? Are we trusting that he is truly God and truly in control? I hope so because he is. There's a football coach by the name of Herm Edwards. He coached in the NFL. He's now coaching in college. And he once said this quote, the players that play on this football team will play for the name on the side of the helmet and not the name on the back of their jersey. Say what you want to say about Herm Edwards. Is he the best football coach in the world? I don't know. He's doing a pretty good job in college right now. Didn't have a hot run in the NFL. But I know this. I appreciate that quote. What happens when the team is only playing for the name on the back of the jersey? They're playing for themselves. They're playing for their best interest. What happens when the team is playing for the name on the side of the helmet? They're playing for the team. What team are we playing for? Am I playing for Team Brad? Or what about this? Team Jesus, maybe. I know it's cheesy. In fact, it's really cheesy. I actually can't believe I just did that. <laughs> when we were baptized into Christ, he made us part of himself. He made us part of Team Jesus. And it's no longer about the name on the back. It's about the blood that bought us to be his own. It's about the blood of Christ that united us. It's about the resurrection who gives us hope for eternity. And it's in that that we find our unity. You know what? There are always going to be things that divide, but the blood of Christ covers it all. And so how do we live as united Christians in this mess with all these divisions. Well, there's three simple things that I think we do. 
Number one, we speak the truth in love. I want you to hear that. Speak the truth in love. Some of us are okay with speaking the truth, but we want to speak the truth and really dig it in, right? No. Speak the truth in love. Did you ever hear Jesus call somebody a derogatory name because they had a different opinion than him? Not really. He would speak the truth. He would point out the problem, but he did it in love. We need to be about speaking the truth with love. Number two, understand this. A social media post is not going to change the world. It will not, especially not a snarky one. And so if we think that our post is going to magically get all these people to rally, it's not. Let's understand what it's really used for. And if we can use it in a positive manner, be the positive example. Be the example of love that Jesus created us to be, that he's called us to be. And finally, love our neighbor as ourselves. Love our neighbor as ourself. None of these things are new. Let me ask you this. If you loved your neighbor as yourself, what's that going to look like? I know I don't like it when somebody gives a snarky comment about me or something I believe in, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. So why would I do that to somebody else? Love your neighbor as yourself. When I disagree with somebody, I can do it lovingly. When I don't like the way things are going, I can speak out in a loving way. Loving my neighbor as myself means I begin to humble myself and understand that I'm not all in all. My all in all is Jesus. And maybe we begin to look at a bigger picture. Nancy, I want to say thank you for that beautiful song you played earlier. This wasn't in my notes, but the song made me think. The chorus of that song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The more our eyes are on our Savior Jesus Christ, the less this stuff that's going on is going to matter because his glory and his grace are eternal. His glory and his grace are perfect and his glory and his grace cover all things, even the mess that we're experiencing right now. So let's be a part of fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let's be a part of speaking the truth in love. Let's be a part of loving our neighbor as ourselves. But it begins with our eyes focused on him. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that your grace covers a multitude of our sins because I know my sin, and my sin just seems to keep multituding, multiplying. God, Forgive us for the times that we've allowed the divisions to be the important thing to us and we've taken our eyes off you. And God, I pray that you would give us the strength to look past divisions and to see you and to see your cross and to see your empty tomb because those are the things that unite us. And to understand that it's your Holy Spirit that is living in each of us. That is calling us to be one body. With you, Jesus, as our head. Thank you. And give us that strength. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our God. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, may he be with and abide with you all. Go in his peace. Amen. Let's join together in singing our closing song.
Please be seated. Just briefly, we do have two Bible studies this morning during the Sunday school hour, and you're welcome to join that. One is by the pastors in 201, and the other one is Jeff Shurset in 102-103. want to invite you to join us for that time to study God's Word together. We want to also invite you during Wednesdays, Pit Stop is back in person this week. There will be an adult Bible class titled The Circle Maker. It begins at 630 for that, for confirmation for Zone 45. I want you to know also that uh, Sunday School for Children is back in person today as well. Youth Garage Sale, because of so many things having to do with COVID, is just postponed right now until further notice. So just keep in touch, and we will actually, we will keep you notified on what that looks like in the future. If you have any email requests, prayer requests that you'd like to send in, if you send them to prayer at stlhouston.org, that would be great. Again, this Thursday at 2 p.m., we want to celebrate Bruce's life and honor God for this incredible man and uh, invite you to join us uh, from 1 to 2 for visitation with Debbie and family or from 2 o'clock here in the sanctuary and also broadcast uh, live stream into the Life Center and also on our media platforms. If you want to support the ministry of St. Timothy with your offerings, you can do so. Leave it in the offering plates and the table in the back. Or if you can give online at stlhoustonlive.org, we appreciate it. And if you would help us by please remaining seated as we dismiss you. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord.